so you can imagine complete darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, human written in the field says previously loaded with the calcium detecting dye and under the converted uh, inverted convocal microscopy we will detect if, uh, if the calcium uh, levels will increase or not. So starting with the vehicle treatment as you can see uh, we are recording the experiment so these cells loaded with the calcium detecting dye will add the vehicle and you can appreciate that there is a slight increase in calcium in calcium uh, in calcium signal okay. but now we will add 15 heat to these previously loaded heat with the calcium dye now you can appreciate addition of the heat and here's the result that because this dye once calcium become in inside the cytosol it will capture the calcium and emit the fluorescence so once we added the heat calcium released into the cytosol the dye captured the calcium and fluorescence uh, increases we did the quantification of this experiment and we could uh, this experiment done multiple times at least three three different independent experiments and we can see that there is really a significant, a a significant difference in the calcium released under the 15 heat treatment. So we concluded that 12-15 uh, lipoxygenase lipid products induce intracellular calcium release in human retina endothelial cells, which may be a suggested mechanism for 12-15 lipoxygenase induced ER stress. Okay. We were, uh, okay. So. <laughs> So, uh, in summary, so hyperglycemia increased the activity of 12-15 lipoxygenase, increasing 12 and 15 heats, which are able to induce calcium release and in disturbance of the calcium homeostasis and depletion of, ER, of endoplasmic particulum stores of calcium, which is able to induce ER stress because most of the calcium, uh, most of the, uh, there are a lot of uh, molecular chaperones within the ER which are calcium dependent so depletion of the calcium from ER significantly affect the molecular chaperones responsible for the proper protein folding and this will increase the number or the amount of unfolded or misfolded proteins within the ER inducing the ER stress and ER stress as well may be upstream from that pH oxidase so ER stress actually has a role in activation of oxidative stress and uh, so this is followed by phosphorylation of VGFR2 and phosphorylation of VGFR2 is implicated in retinal microvascular dysfunction and also the looxate adhesion is, uh, important, uh, is important in induction of the uh, retinal microvascular dysfunction. So in conclusion, activation of 12-15 lipoxygenase is implicated in the pathogenesis of microvascular dysfunction in diabetic retinopathy. ER stress and oxidative stress contribute to 12-15 lipoxygenase mediated retinal interfere cell dysfunction in diabetic retinopathy. 12-15 lipoxygenase is a potential therapeutic target to prevent development of retinal microvascular dysfunction in diabetic retinopathy. So, uh, I just like to share with you these um, co-author publications, and especially this one with Dr. Habib, uh, my wife. So thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is me? This <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, you know, after hours work. <laughs> and I, I want to thank Dr. Taufiq for giving me the opportunity to be on uh, two of her uh, publications. Especially this one, she gave me the opportunity to be the first author of this microRNA studies. And uh, the, my work was uh, published in Diabetology in, uh, it was online in February, so it's not too uh, old. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Shabrawi for giving me the opportunity to join the lab. These some techniques that uh, are not included in my presentation today. But uh, I, I, would, I would like to thank Dr. Ibrahim and uh, Dr. Khaled Hussein. They helped me a lot in, when I joined the lab. So thank you so much. Uh, 
I didn't want to put this, but my PI insisted to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, with the, the work was presented. Actually, this work and this work is not included today because this is the exosome story and this is microRNA story. So we uh, still have two different stories. Uh, hoping to get them out soon. And the, thanks to the VDI <laughs> for uh, two uh, awards I got, 2016 and 2018, which we can say that the VDI and Vision Discovery Institute um, makes it uh, so educational for students to and so collaborative environment in vision science. So thank you so much. So I'd like to acknowledge the no images today. Uh, yeah, please, no picture. Yeah, so I'd like to thank, thank my, uh, my PI, my lab members, even previous lab members, Selena, she was a PhD student and she left the lab, and uh, uh, my committee members, thank you so much for helping me during this, these years. Thank you to Dr. Itaul, uh, uh, my reader today, and thanks to Dr. Megan Lawrence again. Uh, thanks to the CPA and all students, staff, faculty, for the good time you uh, gave me. Uh, during this time, so thanks to Dr. Sylvia Smith and Dr. Hamrick. Uh, thank you to the Graduate School, Dr. Watsky, Dr. Cameron, uh, and all grad, stu grad students. Um, thank you so much, my classmates, all faculty and staff of, of the Graduate School. Uh, I, I will never uh, forget, for example, uh, Linda. For our cell biology, I will never forget Nan. Thank you so much. Uh, those who have, will not, not thank those, even they are not present, this should not be the case. We should remember those people even if they left us. I'll, uh, I won't thank uh, all uh, Afghanistan University members, our funding agents, Egypt, of course, uh, the embassy in Washington DC. I hope they will answer the phone and chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> They, they, they only call me when there is a problem or something. So, uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian Minister of Higher Education, my home uh, university and my home department. Thank you so much. Uh, my family and my friends for sure. I'd uh, like to thank my father. My mother and my brothers. Thank you to my uh, small family. Uh, and and I, I will not I will never forget my uh, my queen. My wife she uh, she actually tolerated me so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I will thank my friends in Egypt. There is a, a big list actually, but uh, you know for the space, <laughs> my work colleagues in Egypt, and my friends in Augusta, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank also the Islamic Society of Augusta and Dr. Nadim for supporting me during these years. So thank you, they, uh, they, not un they are not only a religious organization, they are a community organization helping even non-Muslims. So thank you so much. Uh, for supporting and doing great in the community here in Augusta for uh, all American citizens. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll finish with this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the graduate students. When you were thinking about graduation and having your PhD, your expectation is like this. <laughs> <laughs> and we had Dr. Andrew Fire with us here, so this was the expectation, but reality it's like this. <laughs> so actually, my, my suit didn't, I, I, I picked another one, this is not mine, so, because I, I had this one. <laughs> the one I came with didn't fit, so. So, this was for my, uh, my classmates. Life is short, and you should keep aiming high. Uh, we are losing um, our friends, losing our families, so life is sh so short. Don't waste your time in small things. Just keep aiming high and thank you.
can tell no one beat Egyptian in how fast he can speak. I don't know how he he Not sent well. me the presentation, 127 slides. I said, cut it. He said, it's 77. I said, you need to finish in 45 minutes. And he insisted to continue with this number of slides. And he finished on time. But, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I know how emotional Khalid just to share with you before joining my lab. Khalid, uh, he lost his dad, who used to be a doctor uh, in Egypt. and. Uh, and he was the backbone of his family, and it was hard time for him. And really, Khalid did great job in going over his sadness and his work, and he did great job. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, now the floor is open for questions from the audience. The committee member don't ask any question. <laughs> okay. So it's open for you guys. If you have any question, please. I have a comment on the question. You just mentioned that don't let the bad moments or the sad moments to overcome the good one. Today we are celebrating your graduation, your success. So let's make it happy moment. Okay? okay. We're gonna enjoy you in the Egyptian way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If your mom here gonna do uh, this. <laughs> the floor is open. Questions? Have a question. Oh okay. Sorry. So your study suggests that life oxygenase is a potential uh, therapeutic target to limit uh, retinopathy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you inhibit life oxygenase, what do you think would happen to the uh, cyclooxygenase and the, and the increased production of prostaglandins and thromboxanes? And how would this affect the progression of retinopathy? Actually, this is a very good point because uh, uh, it's important to uh, figure out that we are not these enzymes are not isolated, they are working with each other. So uh, they are within the same environment. So this is uh, ma this makes us so cautious when dealing with these uh, molecules. Especially even the live oxygenase itself, when it works with the substrate arachidonic acid, it produces pro-inflammatory mediators. But when the substrate is different, like DHA or EPA, the product of the same enzyme is anti-inflammatory anti uh, lipid mediators like resolvents, lipoxins, protectins. So it, it should be, uh, we should be so cautious when dealing with these, especially as you just mentioned, all these polyacid fatty acids are a pool of substrates for a number of enzymes like cyclooxygenase, lipoxygenase, cytochrome B450. So manipulating these enzymes should be with great caution uh, to avoid side effects uh, that may happen. Yeah, I do have a question, but I first want to compliment you on being an outstanding student in the department. It's been a pleasure to have you. You've been, always been a great question asker, or if there is such a thing, um, in all of our seminars and in our journal clubs. I think you're truly engaged, and I, I really love that. So thank you for being such a good student. I'm just curious about, we know that vessels have endothelial cells, parasites, and so there's more to them than endothelial cells. So can you just explain your reasoning on studying the endothelial cell again in, 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 your, in your scheme? Yeah, so um, as I just mentioned earlier, the, um, the diabetic retinopathy affects mainly the inner retinal blood barrier. And the inner retinal blood barrier is formed mainly by tight junctions among endothelial cells. Uh, because there are two blood supply, the outer uh, retinal blood barrier formed by the tight junctions between RPE and the outer blood supply is the outer retina supplied by the choroid, while the inner blood, uh, the inner uh, retina supplied by the central retinal artery and the central retinal artery and retinal capillaries are formed of endothelial cells and the affection of the tight junctions between these endothelial cells in, uh, um, led to the, uh, the increase the permeability and the leakage of fluids causing the macular edema. So endothelial cells are affected in diabetic retinopathy, but not only in the field cells, because we said that uh, in, uh, it is a neurovascular disorder, so neurons are affected as well. So this is one aspect of the disease. So we are interested in more in the vascular components. So endothelial cells being um, affected in the, in the form of increased leukocyte adhesion, in tight junction proteins affection, all this implicated in the pathogenesis of the diabetic retinopathy. So we are focusing on the vascular part, but we cannot <coughs> neglect the other part, and actually the work in going in our lab to uh, look at the neuronal impact 
of the and Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim is doing uh, a lot of uh, great work with the neuronal aspect in knockout in liposuccess knockout mice because it is not an only not only a vascular disease it is also a neurovascular disease neurons will be affected. As well. I think Dr. Smith is talking about the vascular element, which I have, including pericide as part of the vascular component, but because the screening also of uh, localization of uh, 250 live oxygenase in retina was primarily in the ciliate sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I uh, wanted to the I may have missed that, but uh, so why did you uh, propose in the beginning that med EH is upstream of the ER is stressed, and is it like, is it already, that was the question, but anyway, is, is it already established in the literature, and is the other way around that ER is stressed up to, that VH is also published in other models? Okay, let me tell you this, this part. This is what we uh, portray, this axis, but actually what we uh, think about, this is not a linear pathway. This is, all these can be interacting, so, ER stress can induce oxidative stress, oxidative stress can induce <coughs> ER stress, ER stress incre the, uh, increase leakage of calcium and calcium can induce ER, uh, oxidative stress, oxidative stress increases calcium, intracellular calcium, and this can induce ER stress. So all these elements are interacting. But the point here that oxidative stress is not only done by NABH oxidase. NABH oxidase is one source for reactive oxygen species and can there are other sources of oxidative stress. So we now are excluding that uh, the uh, NADPH oxidase uh, or the pathway is not through the NADPH oxidase. Also, NADPH oxidase can be upstream, and there are reports reporting that live oxygen is uh, regulating, regulated through the NADPH oxidase. So it can be all around, not a linear pathway. It can be also everything is interacting with each other. I hope this answers the question. Yes, great work and wonderful presentation. Thank Congratulations. Uh, another one. So you, you showed a lot of data demonstrating the mechanism downstream. So the initially the first one, so my question is hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. What's the mechanism of hyperglycemia? What's the activation of the pathway? Okay, so hyperglycemia act increase the activity of the enzyme. How this happens? This uh, actually this is the big question uh, related to the regulation of 12-15 live oxygenase. This is largely unknown. Uh, the receptor for the uh, the, uh, the bioactive lipid products uh, of the uh, live oxygenase, like heat, the receptors are not uh, identified yet. So uh, there are promoters. Uh, the promoter of the enzyme is active. Is uh, there are transcription factors like STAT1, STAT3, STAT6, and these are upregulated during hyperglycemia as well. So the regulation of live oxygenase is uh, a big question. We are still working on it. We, we uh, proposed uh, studies for uh, you know, um, epigenetic um, modifications to find out how this enzyme is regulated uh, exactly, but this, these are still ongoing experiments. I have a question, maybe a naive question. Is there any uh, a drug or uh, pharmaceutical product that can affect live oxygenase activity? Like, what's the translational uh, impact of your research? Okay, so uh, the drug you see we were inhibiting live oxygenase with is, is the Bicol. A Bicol is an inhibitor for live oxygenase, but not a specific inhibitor for live oxygenase. It is more generally uh, an antioxidant drug. So developing new specific inhibitors for live oxygenase will uh, be uh, very a good, very good evidence even in studying the best enzyme. But for, for this research, we have uh, the the core of of the uh, experiments is the ER stress. So ER stress itself inhibitors of ER stress like uh, toro deoxycholic acid or TODCA and PPA phenylpyrotoric acid. Those are FDA approved drugs for treatment of TODCA is for uh, treatment of primary cirrhosis. Uh, PPA is for urea cycle disorders. So uh, and they are uh, uh, drugs with a high safety. Um, Profile, so and also they started to introduce ER stress manipulators in clinical trials for cancer. For instance, tunicamycin uh, and thapsigargin, which are ER stress inducers, but not a monotherapy for ER stress induction. Along with rapamycin, uh, research showed that they decreased the uh, tumor load in mice. 
So they start to introduce uh, ER cyst manipulators in clinical trials, but in cancer still in clinical trials. As I told you, inhibitors for ER cyst, uh, TOTCA and uh, PPA, are FDA approved for primary pair cirrhosis and uh, urea cycle disorders. Okay. Question? More question? I'll take one. Thank you for a great presentation, and uh, I know that uh, you can testify very hard work behind that, long hours. But I have a clinical question. Um, so this process, when they start, mm -hmm. is there any way that it's reversible, or the process will continue on from the hyperglycemia to uh, stress, uh, you know, uh, uh, ER stress and that pH? So is there any way you can stop that, or the treatment? We know that for the uh, for the vascularization, mm -hmm. we have a treatment for the uh, for retinopathy. But is there any treatment? I know you mentioned two medications. Yeah. So, uh, because all the research has to come to the clinical side. Yeah. To, you know, so to be, you know, to be successful. So what exactly is yeah. that? Sure. So, uh, basic the first drugs available, the FDA approved drugs now are anti-VGF and corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. Anti-VGF for the inhibition of progression of new blood vessel formation, right. and the uh, corticosteroids because the concept of inflammation. This is an inflammatory disease. The first line of treatment is tight glycemic control. And tight glycemic control significantly reduced the progression of the disease, but did not stop it. And this is actually the rationale for ongoing grants for diabetic retinopathy to find new early targets, trying to interfere with the pathogenesis as early as possible and make it not progressing. And as, as I mentioned, 100% of type 1 diabetes patients will develop diabetic retinopathy. This is basically because the long duration those are diabetic because type 1 starts early in life. Type 2, 60% because type 2 starts late. If type 2 diabetic patients life is extended, I'm for sure they will default, 100% will default diabetic retinopathy because the pathogenesis is, in, is in going. And this is basically the aim of the ongoing research to find out new early targets trying to stop the progression of disease or even delay the progression of the disease to give better quality of life for those patients. Dr. Gell, among the most people prescribe anti-VGF, by the way. Yeah. He's an oncologist, so... <laughs> Unfortunately, for different reasons. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how should I excuse me? I'm not asking you personally. I just wanted to say a few words to Kali. Kali, you're the first one defending from our batch. Great presentation. And... <laughs> all of our class has seen you from day one. You have shown unfaltering confidence running through your PhD, which is not an easy, easy thing to do. So, congratulations again. <laughs> More question? Okay, thank you guys for coming. Uh, uh, this is okay, just quick question. Now you're done with the PhD, that means you're going to leave? Yeah, I'll go back to you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, he, he got an offer in Indiana, and uh, like uh, hopefully he can come back. But anyway, thank you again for uh, your uh, attendance. And uh, now we are moving to the exam. I think uh, uh, graduate students are more than welcome to attend the exam. Okay. Don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Observers only. Oh, now I am. Uh, this is for me. Now we are getting rid of one victim. We are ready to get another victim. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.